Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you and uh, to think uh, what a unique class this is. Uh, for the last two weeks, you've been uh, had the occasion to hear uh, well-trained scholars, and uh, not a lot of people get to do something like that. But you do here at Believer's Chapel. Uh, we are in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 22. We are in now the wise sayings, and I want you to set a tab before you look at the text this morning on Isaiah chapter 16. And then we will begin our study this morning with verse 24. So I'll let you turn there and get yourself situated in the Bible there. So chapter 22, 24, and a tab at Isaiah chapter 16. Do not associate with a temper, a man with a hot temper, or with a wrathful person. Do not get involved. And here's the reason, verse 25, lest you learn his ways and you get entangled, or the word often used as ensnared. And notice it is for your life personally. 26 and 27, we're going to skip that wise saying because we've actually covered it two or three times in the book of Proverbs one way or the other, and when we come to the wise sayings, if we have covered that topic, we will skip it because it's a repetition for what we've already had before. So we pick up here with 28. Do not move the ancient boundary that your ancestors have set. And then verse 29. Do you see a person skilled in his work or his commission? He will present himself before kings. He will not present himself before obscure people. Okay, here's our exposition beginning in verse 24 this morning. Do not associate with a man of temper. Uh, a consistent theme in the Proverbs is to make your association with wise friends, associates, etc. Along and parallel to that, stay away from those who practice foolish behavior. In this case, it is angry behavior. It is to be avoided. Such people become irrational in that state and lose all sense of proportion. I've actually seen it a couple of times with individuals. They both went into therapy. Neither had a Christian testimony. And to my knowledge, they have uh, found some way of coping. But it was horrible to see their behavior. It was a temper of violence that went on for a long period of time. And it's not a, a quick strike of temper. No, this is something entirely different. It was actually described to me as rage. That's the idea. I want you to see a very unique feature in the parallelism of this proverb. The person with this temper is synonymous with a wrathful individual. 
Proverbs 29, 22. You see the same thing. An angry man stirs up strife, and the hot-tempered causes much transgression. So there it is again. The wrathful man is the sinful man. We have a picture of this type of wrath in uh, Genesis 27, 44, where Esau planned to kill his brother Jacob for stealing his birthright. His rage toward Jacob was full of revenge, and his mother, Jacob's mother, suggested that he leave the family, which he did. He parted and thus saved his own life. Here's our reasoning, verse 25, lest you learn his ways and you get entangled. Your translation, ensnared or snared for your life. This opening word, lest, or you, your translation might have, or, sets the stage for a rational argument here. So we're given a reason for staying clear of this temperous person. His ways are not only lethal, we find, but the scripture says they're infectious. You learn from watching him or being associated with him. The term means to become accustomed to. Remember, the Proverbs t teach us over and over that man never remains in neutral. He is always moving someplace. He is moving from fool to foolish to ultimately the mocker. Now he's unreachable. He's the hardened sinner that can never be brought back to a knowledge of the truth. Or you can become wise, made wise, by opening the Scriptures by the power of the Spirit of God and taught the Scriptures, and you become wiser and wiser still. Till you get to the point of being like Job, who said he put on righteousness as his clothing. He didn't even think about it anymore. It just became natural to him. That's the idea. Look at this end of the top line, his ways. The behavior of the temperous person who conducts his affairs, well, he conducts his affairs like driving a road grader on Central Expressway in five o'clock traffic. He mushes, he mangles, he doesn't care who is in his way or around him. That's this irrationality that takes over. I want you to see this interesting word, get. You're, if you have the New King James, it says set. If you have a New American Standard, it's translated as to find. Now I'm going to show you this word and you're never going to forget it because it explains the entire proverb for us. This small little particle. To get means to receive. And one is passive, not active, in doing so, in receiving or getting. And that's actually the force of this particle. And here's the word. It's found in Genesis chapter 4 in verse 11. It's about Cain having the ground cursed. Remember, he had a green thumb before. But in killing his brother Abel, one of the curses that fell upon him is that the ground would no longer work for him. It was cursed from him. So here's the use of the word. To get or to receive. The Lord says, Genesis 4.11, Now you are cursed from the ground which had opened its mouth for you, but now it get or it received the blood of your brother Abel. See, the ground wasn't doing anything. It was passive. And then the blood hit it, and God cursed the ground from this man. 
So it's passive. Now, that explains the last word of our proverb. Look, ensnared, to be snared, used of a trap for an animal. So what's the idea? Well, you make an association with this kind of person, you're totally passive. But what happens? The next thing you know, he is irrationally off in a temper. And you're there. You're associated with him. And the next thing you know, you're in the middle of something. Somebody pulls a gun. Somebody screams. It's turmoil. And you're there. That's the force of the word. Stay clear of the temper. They're only people for trouble. 26 and 27, we are going to skip because we've covered it. Surety for a stranger. Never be a bank. Give. Give. Give voluntarily. But don't be a loner. Uh, don't expect repayment. You have lending institutions for that. Not out of your own back pocket. And that's clearly the teaching of the book of Proverbs. Now, we come to saying number five, which is quite interesting. You have to know the culture here to get the teaching. Verse 28. 22, 28. Do not move the ancient boundary that your ancestors have set. The ancient boundary is a reference to the time of Joshua when the land was distributed in and under the providence of God. The land and territory was parceled out, remember, by the casting of lots. The land was granted to each tribe, then to a clan, and from a clan to a family. And it was your inheritance, sacred inheritance, that came from God specifically and directly to the Israelite believer. That's the idea. And it was now codified in the law of Moses itself. Here it is. Deuteronomy 19.14 You must not move your neighbor's boundary which, he, which was set up by your ancestors to mark the inheritance you shall receive in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. These boundary markers were stone pillars erected between family properties. Your ancestors refers to the former generations that marked out the boundaries of the family. When they settled the land, look at this. The closing last words, have set. That's a very common verb in the Old Testament. It means something has been put into a legal effect. In other words, have set is governed under the law of Moses. Now, why is that important? Because back then, you didn't have surveyors. You didn't have surveyor equipment. You had the boundary marker. And you were not to tamper with it. That is the proverb you can see what the proverb is pointing to. Someone would say, move the boundary marker six inches, five inches every year. Two or three generations later, now you have considerable piece of land, much more than you were in Inherited or given from the beginning. It is actually breaking the eighth commandment not to steal. The book of Proverbs is interested in particularly, 
protecting the fatherless and the widow. Constantly see that theme. They need the protection the most. And in the local church, we paid particular attention to the widow. We, uh, we are to protect her. And we are to make sure that she is taken care of. That's all spelled out by the Apostle Paul in giving instructions to the local church. Here's what, in effect, happened in the history of Israel. You remember, kings are not like a democracy. They have absolute rule, authority, and power. And as the monarchy progressed, kings, which was one and the same as the government itself, seized ancestral lands from the people. And that caused the prophets of God to rise up and pronounce judgments upon them. Hosea chapter 5 and verse 10. The princes of Judah are like those who move the ancient boundaries. Upon them, said the Lord, I will pour out my wrath like water. What's the fifth wise saying? Do not ever be guilty of taking advantage of anyone or anything, particularly the weak. The Lord sees all. The Lord knows all. And the Lord will deal with that person particularly for what they have done. That brings us to verse 29, the sixth wise saying. In the book of Proverbs, we have, I have tried to specifically reference Proverbs that you're probably somewhat familiar with. You may not know where they occur in the book, uh, but you can pretty much quote them verbatim. You're familiar with them, and you're familiar with the content. And those Proverbs I have tried to really drill down on uh, so that there is no misunderstanding exactly what that prominent proverb was teaching. For example, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge Him. He'll direct your path. We spent a lot of time on that. Uh, 22.1, uh, How much better is a good name than silver and gold? Well, that's totally contrary to the world. The world doesn't care about your name or your reputation. Just show me the box. How wealthy are you? Believe me, you'll be welcomed someplace, somewhere, and you'll find lots of friendships and associates. How about this one, 22.6? Train up a child in the way he will go, and in the end he will not depart from it. We spent a lot of time. And now that brings us to verse 29 and the sixth wise saying. You probably already know it. You probably memorized it. Do you see a person skilled in his commission? I think we all uh, memorize that word, commission, as work. That's the way I memorize the proverb. And here's line two. He will present himself before kings. He will not present himself before obscure people. This proverb, you think, is rather simple. At least I did when I approached it. But there are a couple of very unique features. And it, I spent quite a bit of time on it, and I want to share that with you. 
the first unique feature is this opening. Do you see? It's a unique question. In the actual language, the word do is not there. It's just one simple word. But it's absolutely correct to translate it in English that way because it is an implied question that expects a positive answer. Do you see? It opens in what is called a polar question. I had never heard that before. Polar being a pole star. It is a guide. It's a reference point. An observation to guide us. Now, the significance of that is the context itself. We haven't spent much time on context or on structure in the book of Proverbs. It becomes way too complicated and I just wanted to get the teaching of the proverb out. So I skipped that portion. I'll leave that to better people. Look, here is the context. And I think it will highlight our verse 29. From verse 22 forward, we have been given negative admonitions. Verse 22, do not rob. Verse 24, do not associate. Verse 26, do not be among those. Verse 28, do not move. All negatives. Teaching in the negative. But we come to verse 29, and here is not the negative, but rather we are to follow a very positive affirmation. That's the unique opening here. Do you see the second and third words? You see? That's almost identical to see, which was used throughout the Old Testament for the prophets themselves. It was God's gift to them to be able to see. Our opening is you see, which is extremely close. Just a difference, slightly. Uh, we have this opening in one other place in the Proverbs. That's why it's so unique. 2920, do you see? It calls for a close examination or inspection. Something like Psalm 11, verse 4. The Lord is on His holy temple. He is on His heavenly throne. His eyes see to see. What's he doing? He is examining the men of the earth. It's somewhat like uh, 2 Chronicles 16.9. The eyes of the Lord range to and fro throughout the earth. I think of it in my mind like the giant searchlights that go back and forth at a Hollywood opening someplace. It's the eyes of the Lord looking to and fro all over to find faithful people throughout the earth. That's the idea. And the last word of the opening, it's a person. So we're keeping a sharp lookout for a certain individual. That's the unique opening. Now here's the second unique feature. It's a person that is skilled or skillful. Now, when I read this, I said, well, uh, I'll fly through this proverb rather quickly because we all know that word. That's the word skill. That's the word wisdom. And we all know what that means. We've been talking about it for a long time in the book of Proverbs. But surprise, surprise, that's not the word at all. This is a different word. Now, let me give you that use of that word because it only occurs four places in all the Old Testament. Here they are. The first is Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6, describing the Old Testament leader, and the King James translates it, a ready scribe in the law. In other words, he was a capable man in the revelation of God. 
as it was given up to that time. So today in the local church, we look for people that are skilled are skillful in the Word of God. Doesn't mean that they have what Dr. Johnson referred to as the book of, uh, as the uh, gift of utterance, but they were capable people in understanding the Scriptures. That's the idea of the use. He was a strong man in the Word of God. Here's the second use. Psalm 45, verse 1. And there it's translated as a ready writer or ready scribe. Now, what does a ready writer or scribe do? Well, he edits, he revises, he perfects his written composition. And that's what he tells us that he did. He thought carefully through the use of every word that was in that psalm, and he put it to paper. That's what he did. Edits, revises, perfects. But here's the third. And this one, I think you'll find, as I found, most intriguing. Isaiah 16 and verse 5. That's why I wanted you to set a tab at Isaiah 16. Look at this. This is a prophetic word concerning the Messiah written 700 years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving us a prophetic word about Him and His kingdom. A throne will be established. Now, we know that word. We've seen it many times in the Proverbs. Psalm 11, verse 2, set using that arrow set against the string, fixed, put in place. A throne will be established in mercy. Now we know that word. That's hesed. That's covenant loyalty. Can't be defined by an English word. It has all kinds of meaning. There it is. And He, so there's a person, a personality, will sit upon it in faithfulness. Now, that word is truth. In the tent or tabernacle of David, what's he doing? Judging. Very famous Old Testament word. Judging. Ruling. Guiding. And seeking justice. And here's our word from Proverbs 22-29. I'm going to use two translations because I think it emphasizes what's going on here. The first is from John Oswald. He wrote the latest commentary on Isaiah. It's very helpful. And he translates the word as prompt. You go to the Hebrew di uh, lexicon, dictionary, and you look up the word and it's translated as hastening. Well, you see the force of these two translations. Hastening, prompt. It's the idea of something moving quickly, promptly, not hastening. And the final word is righteousness. In the future, the Messiah, according to Isaiah, is to sit upon a throne in covenant loyalty. Now let's think about that for a second. When Democrats get into office, they govern from the left, and their administration is always left. When the Republicans get in, they govern from the right, and things are more conservative. This government is not on the left or right. This government is covenant loyalty. It's Hesed. It's something beyond the thoughts and mind of a man's politic. This is righteousness. Amazing. And this throne, notice, 
is called David's. It's historic. It identifies itself with David. Now, that takes us to 2 Samuel 7, where we get the Davidic covenant. Remember, David sees the ark out there in the tabernacle, and he says, I live in a palace. I have a home. I want to build a, a, pla- a palace, a place for the ark of the Lord. What do you think about that, Nathan? And Nathan said, oh, that's great. That's a wonderful idea. Let's do that. And then Nathan went home and he slept. And the Lord came to him at night in a vision. And he said, you tell my servant David, he is not to build me a palace, a temple. He's got blood on his hands. He's been a killer all his life. You go back and you tell my servant David that that he wanted to build me a house. No, I'm going to build him a house. What was that house? Well, it wasn't 1604 Greenbrier Avenue. No, it's not an edifice. It's a line. That was the house. It was the line of David. It was all the kings. They are his ancestors. And the final one is the Messiah himself. That's why it's the force of what Peter was saying on Solomon's portico in Acts 2. David died. His sepulcher is here among us. But the one he spoke of prophetically went way beyond him. He was talking about the Messiah. And then Peter skillfully threads it together that that Messiah is none other than the Christ, the man Jesus that you crucified. Now, The Lord will establish, set, fix, forever that final descendant upon the throne. What makes this so striking is Mark's teaching us Luke. Dan's teaching us John from two different perspectives. Two cameras on the same stage. We are getting perspectives of our Messiah, the man Jesus. He comes, He presents Himself, and He comes as the King. But what do they do? They reject Him. They reject Him in His first offering. But in this prophecy, They will be rejecting no more. His kingdom is getting established. It's going to take place. And it's going to be here. Associated with David, the king of Israel, he will rule from Israel. Look, he sits, says the text, judging in covenant loyalty. (laughs) My friends, if this is in heaven... Those terms are not needed. You don't need, in, in heavenly places, we're all perfect. There's no need for judging anymore. There's no need. But if this is of the earth, it fits perfectly. You see, this is a future kingdom on the earth. It makes perfect sense. Messiah judging from David's throne dealing with the nations, all in covenant loyalty and in righteousness, which highlights the word that we're studying. Look at it. Skillfully hastening. Prompt hastening. Not like the government of men. No. There's, they slowly make changes. They implement policy over time. No, this is not like that. This is overnight, prompt, quick righteousness. It encompasses the entire world. Now just think about that. He came first and He presented the kingdom. 
They rejected him. But he comes again and he's going to establish the kingdom. And that's the way it's going to be. That's the force and it's going to happen quickly and seamlessly. And that's the third use of our word. Now back to our proverb. Here's the fourth use. Skill. What is it? Well, it's high competence. It's high ability. Outside of the Hebrew language, the word in the ancient Near East really translated it referencing a craftsman making a fine piece of furniture. It is called learned experience. And that fits because Christ came. He offered the kingdom. He dealt with men. He will come back and He will establish the kingdom dealing with men. That is what you have often. This is not gift. Uh, This is not a Michelangelo. This is not talent. No, this is learned experience which makes it so practical for our proverb. Think with me about it. Ezra had to learn the language. That was his competency. He had to learn and he studied and he applied himself and he dedicated himself to a learned experience in the law. The same with our psalmist, Psalm 45. He was writing regarding the king. He had worked at it and he polished it to a perfection, learned experience. And so it is with the Messiah. He came once, He will come again, and there will be absolute power from His throne, the throne of David. A master plan executed speedily all for a kingdom on the earth. Here is... The coup de grace, as far as I'm concerned, from our Lord's own lips, His prayer. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. That's the kingship. It's coming. Here's the end of the top line. His commission. His work. The lexicon translates that as an occupation. It was used of the fishermen in the boat uh, of Tarshish. Remember, Jonah caught the boat down in Tarshish. Remember, he got the boat. There was a terrible storm. They threw lots to see who's the cause of the storm. The lot fell on Jonah. Jonah 1.8. The fishermen said, what is your occupation? Work. What do you do? Here's line two. He'll present himself. To present means to stand firmly up to or against. Used throughout Exodus 8, Moses and Aaron presenting themselves before Pharaoh. Standing in the Old Testament also implies ability. Psalm 1 verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. They have no ability to stand. They're still in their sins. They're corrupt. They can't stand. We talk about standing in in a courthouse. A legal standing. If you don't have standing, you can't represent or be represented because the court doesn't recognize you. That's the word. And that's the application of the word. Now, the end of line two... I want you to notice something subtly because I had missed it for all my years. Notice it's kings, plural. Not singular. This is more than one king. This man, this woman presents themselves to authority. You see, you can't hide them. With learned experience, they have a wide audience. They're recognized everywhere. Here's the last line. The repetition of our word to present, to stand. This person with learned experience is going to rise above and beyond. Rich, poor, high, low. He, she distinguishes themselves. Now, let me give you the living illustration of it. 
Here's Goliath out taunting the men of Israel. Where's Saul, the king? Well, he's way back over in his tent. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And suddenly these soldiers bring in this young boy. And he says, I'll fight the giant. He's the only one. And Saul says, well, this giant, he's been a killer from his youth. And what did David say? Remember? It's his learned experience. The paw of the bear. The paw of the lion. I'll go fight this guy. That's your word. Let me conclude the proverb with some practical application. What do people tell you you're good at? You know, you're really good at that. Okay? So, stay there. Stay with what you're really good at. And keep working on it. Keep developing that skill. Keep at it. Over and over. That's learned experience. Be dedicated to it. Competent. Proficient as a man or as a woman. To the end that God would be glorified through you in your profession. I think of Charles Howard. He was a surgeon, my goodness. The influence that he had on people everywhere. Not just here at the chapel, but everywhere for the kingdom. A person that has surrendered their life can spread a very, very broad net for everyone. It may be that God has put you in a place you had never thought. I never trained for this. I trained for that. But He's put me here. Stay there. God knows what He's doing. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Think of it this way. When Joseph stepped on that slave block down in Egypt, he did not know one word of Egyptian. He did not know the culture. But when his brothers appeared before him, they didn't recognize him. Because he was for all intents and purposes a sophisticated Egyptian. He went along with where God put him. Jeremiah 29.7 Listen to the providence of God. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you will prosper. You know, I tell young men as I have had occasion to have a ministry to them, I tell them 1 Timothy 4.6 Pay close attention to your life. You see, you can't lead your wife and you can't lead your children and you can't lead anybody else unless you can lead yourself. So start there. Be competent in godliness. There. Right there. Paul said he disciplined himself for it and to that purpose. Be like that. Be a man and a woman in godliness where your progress is known to all. We open the proverb with the unique question. Do you see? See, the world is screaming for that kind of person. They are looking for that kind of person. The Bible tells us that the world is looking. My exhortation from the proverb to you is simply this. Be that person. Be that person. For the benefit of all of us who know you and are associated with you. And for the kingdom. The kingdom that is sure to come. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Uh, bless your word to the hearts, minds, lives 
of your people. Thank you for Believer's Chapel, for the testimony that it has had in this city, and for this class, and the excellent, excellent exposition that has come from it over the years. Bless it to the end that Christ might be glorified forever and ever. Amen.